I know that pretty early on, after the beginning of March, uh, young people in Kailaun district were already very much interested in finding ways in which they could get involved with the hand washing and they understood that chlorine, they may not have understood how exactly it worked, they felt that the hand washing, keeping clean, could protect them against Ebola. And it, from in the community level, young people were saying, let's do something about it. I understand that in Bo District, the communities working with the local council, very early on in the process, set about trying to build their own um, isolation units and treatment centers. Because the districts in the east, especially Kenem and Kailau, are opposition strongholds, uh, the people felt that they didn't expect much from the government. And there were a lot of complaints that the government was not providing the PPE to their nurse, to the nurses who worked in the district. They were not providing the funds for the for sensitization um, in those districts. So those people felt very much that they were on their own. There was a lot of a very positive response from diaspora in Kenema and Kailaun district in terms of providing food and encourage you know helping people through the quarantine period right from the beginning from july we issued a press release asking the government to provide personal protective equipment to women in their homes because we knew that women were going to be the first responders uh, we know that some of the messages that they they put out are, are messages that the women cannot comply with. You can't be at home with your children and you say, you say, if your child is sick, don't touch. If you're an old person in your house is sick, don't touch. The idea is around that somehow it is the experts, the authorities who are going to solve the Ebola problem, but it isn't. It's the communities and it's the women in the communities who have to be at the forefront of the fight against Ebola. They're the ones who are dealing with health care carrying the bulk of the provision of health care in our communities anyway. But in the NGO that I work, for instance, because we're very grassroots, one of the things that we noticed instantly, you know, months and months ago, we, and we started doing, was training traditional healers. We went around finding traditional healers and saying to them, here's this new virus, you know, we know that there are a number of things that rightly you can cure. And, and indeed, a lot of um, traditional healers do know you know, what herbs and things to use to cure basic illnesses like malaria. But actually, they'd never, you know, they don't know um, about Ebola themselves and risk being infected and also spreading it. So we worked a lot with traditional healers and it was, and I wasn't surprised that they were very receptive because they understood that this was their, about their protection. Out of that came the call, for instance, to actually make more links with the health, health um, the actual formal health system so our organization was actually able to help those traditional healers to make links with their local health centers so the referral pathway could be better. But you know, I'm sure that when we go back in a few months time or in a few weeks time to check about how they're doing, they're not gonna stop um, doing what they do all the time because that's their livelihood. So if, you know, if we wanted them to stop, what can we put in place in the short term that will make it possible for them to stop practicing and absolutely send everyone to the health center? And even that has its own problems, because if you send everyone to the health center, then that means an influx into an already weak system that's not able to deal with what's happening right now. So it's a really complex situation. There are many things that people are doing for themselves. So I can look at the number of local NGOs that we work with. Say there's an organization called Health for All Coalition, for instance, a local grassroots organization who on their own back took, you know, to, to kind of monitor quarantines and to see how effective they are. Um, I can look at another organization, a wonderful organization that works with uh, women and children um, called Fawi. And Fawi have been working so hard to try and see how girls can get education in you know, during this time. It's so hard that so many children are out of school in a country where the, health, the education system is already so weak. Um, and this is almost a whole academic year that children are going to be out of school. 
So that, and you know, I go back to the organization that I work in, where for instance, we've done a keep safe at home toolkit to try and help our staff stay safe, especially over um, Christmas as that comes up. And one of the things that, you know, just an ordinary member of staff has done is in doing it, he's gone to his local mosque and he set up a hand washing station at, at his local mosque. So people are doing a lot of things. They're not, you know, just sitting there and waiting. My home church back in Liberia, Zion Grove Baptist Church, actually puts together these home kits of it's um, water, bleach, and other household things that people can use. My brother recently, he's back in the States, he did a fundraising event where he, um, all the proceeds went to my church so that they can buy more materials to give to the households within our community, with our, within our cities and our communities. Within our city, it's called Broville. And so they're going house to house, delivering these packages. People don't have to pay for them, but they just have to buy all of the materials that go into these packages. Um, so that's one that I know of. And they're also spreading messages about, you know, how to keep yourself healthy, how to keep yourself clean, keep your surroundings clean, and what to do when you do come into contact with someone that has the virus.